fine, thank you. Antes de nada, para que te... Well, so to give you some feedback, I will show you again the room, the conference room, uh, the webcam, uh, as, uh, well, some people are still uh, arriving and they will be joining us in a few minutes, some more people. Um, I am going to introduce you now. Uh, Stephen Vance is a Canadian, born in Montreal, and as you know, he's an expert, a renowned world expert on the field of online learning. And he shows that on his many uh, interventions in congresses and conferences all through the world in the five continents. His um, numerous articles, published work, books, um, papers, etc., and published in many um, supports, many formats. Right now, Stephen Downs is working at the Council of National Council of Research, Nas National Results Council of Canada, and he's a researcher within this uh, body of the e-learning research group in the uh, at the Institute for Information Technology, and as well as being a theorist, uh, there is some very interesting issue that he applies his commitment to the open contents and to the spreading of open knowledge. And I will give you two examples. Through his web page, through his excellent website, which is very easy to locate, three W's uh, point his name in the uh, Canada domain, which is CA, you can find and download and download uh, under Creative Commons rights, most of his uh, interventions, papers, and ebooks in many formats. So it is still easier to access them and to be able to run them through any, uh, almost any device. Uh, another example of uh, his real uh, practical commitment is uh, in the year 2005, he received an award. Uh, for Edu blog at the best individual blog because uh, with his blog Alt Daily which you can also find in his uh, in his web page you can find a link to that web blog and in one more example of that commitment uh, Stephen uh, is going to be recording his uh, conference so you're going to be able to to watch that on YouTube is uh, one more way of um, accessing uh, his uh, knowledge and uh, one more proof of his knowledge with the uh, open knowledge he's also a, a photographer uh, you can see examples in his galleries in his web page and uh, well, uh, the, the, the introducer of uh, this um, conference, which is uh, called, as you say, the New Processes for the Production, uh, Distribution, and the Spreading of Knowledge, it is a perfect metaphor, which is the idea that he's going to give us an image, a portrait of the uh, open online communities. Um, learning communities with the MOOC, um, the, the massive open online courses, and the future perspectives of arising out of those courses. So, Stephen, the floor is yours, and when you please, you you can start. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be able to talk to you today. As you can see, I'm located here in my home office in, well, not my home office, it's actually my office office here in Moncton, New Brunswick, Canada. This is where I work at the National Research Council. Here's what it looks like outside today. Just to see you have this sense of what the weather is like here. I'm so sorry you had to see that. Uh, the introduction was quite right. I am broadcasting this talk on YouTube right now. 
it's a live broadcast and uh, according to my hangout screen we have four viewers online uh, I'm also broadcasting it on my online radio station called Ed Radio and uh, I'm not sure how many people we have online for that so I can take a quick look maybe and, and find out uh, but it's always difficult to tell uh, let me just reload here and we have zero listeners so uh, <laughs> that's kind of average for Ed Radio Ed Radio is the world's least popular radio station I'm proud to say uh, nonetheless um, I've been running it for more than a year and uh, it's just an example of doing something for the sake of doing something I want to talk today about massive open online courses and I also want to talk today about open educational resources a bit how the two of those blend together and I'll be talking about some of the design principles for massive open online courses at least the kind that I make and I'll talk or I'll show uh, some examples I'll show some of this the software here online that we use at least to make our own open online courses it's uh, not world famous or popular software like Coursera or edX or whatever but it's been around longer and it's worked pretty well for us so I'm gonna fire up some slides here because I can and uh, let's see I always have trouble finding the slides that I want uh, because there we go so let, let's go back to the beginning so there we go there's the uh, slideshow uh, if you're wondering about that picture on the front uh, this is a photograph I took a couple of days ago this is the river that runs through the center of Moncton as you can see we've had a little bit of snow recently so let me begin by talking about what I did yesterday and what I did yesterday is I went to a website called Complexity Explorer and I signed on to the online course at Complexity Explorer and I'm just going to pop in there ever so briefly and let's see if I can't do this whoops that's not what I meant to do well uh, well that's not it there's no fast way there we go so here's the site and it's just the course that was put online by Santa Fe Institute and Portland State University and uh, there's an intro video to the course and uh, so here's the intro video and it's changed oh <laughs> it's changed uh, that's funny it was uh, the video was about a minute and 30 seconds uh, uh, yesterday now it's a seven minute video I'm not playing the audio so you don't need to worry about it the instructor is Melanie Mitchell and uh, uh, let's see what's in oh it's just telling us how to sign up and stuff like that so I signed up for it I watched the video which as I say was different yesterday and the point I want to make here is how easy this all was how easy it was for me to sign up for this course to watch the video to begin to get involved with this online course and that's the thing that is new with massive open online courses we we think about you know the the number of people in them we think all oh, there's thousands hundreds of thousands or whatever people in the course but to me what's really important what's really noteworthy is how simple how easy how low an investment it is to actually begin 
to take one of these courses and to actually study one of these courses online. According to a site that I saw recently called myeducationpath.com, there are almost 6,000 courses online. When I looked at it the other day, there were 5,918. And of course, this number is going up and up and up. But an astonishing number of courses. When you consider that in 2008, there were none. And even last year, or at the end of 2011, there was only a handful of courses. And we've gone from that to 6,000 courses today. I run a site called www.mooc.ca. Uh, it needs a bit of a redesign because it's become a bit popular. But I've been tracking news about massive open online courses on the site. I have a newsletter which has become very popular on that site. It's not the same as my OL Daily newsletter. And I'll be working with my education path to advertise new courses and to help people search for and locate the courses that they're looking for. And it's, it's interesting how global this phenomenon has become in the last year and it speaks to me at least about how popular, how much of a demand there is for massive open online learning. It's, it's interesting because people where I work talk about, you know, you need to show a market pull for these things. You need to show that there is a demand in the marketplace. And to me, an environment where you go from zero to hundreds of thousands of subscribers and thousands of courses in the space of a year shows that there is a significant demand, a significant market pull, again, as they say, for these, these courses. So anyhow, where did it begin? It began with the first massive open online course and I said at a talk yesterday it's a big secret that massive open online courses were invented in Moncton where I live but they were and the first course was CCK08 or Connectivism and Connective Knowledge 2008 and I just found out the other day the archives from that course are back online. They were off for a while. So you can see the online discussion forum and the course Moodle from the link at the left and then the daily newsletter which is the part that I produced available at the right. So George Siemens and I launched this course as I say in 2008 and as we like to tell people we expected maybe 20 25 people to join the course but we set it up so that it would be an open course and a distributed open online course which I'll talk about through this talk and instead of 25 students we got 2300 students and that's what started the phenomenon that's when we realized and we realized right away that we had something here that we were tapping in to something that was going to be important. So we continued doing our own online courses. We did a course, we did CCK09 the following year, so we repeated the same course and had, again, more thousands of people. We did a course called Personal Learning Environments, Networks, and Knowledge, or PLANK, 2010. This was uh, George Siemens and myself, as well as Dave Cormier and Rita Kopp. We also did a course called Change, 
It was Change 11. It started in 2011 and finished in 2012. It was a very long course, as you can see here, week 35. One of the things we learned about MOOCs with this course was 35 weeks is too long for an open online course. Even so, we had people participate from beginning to end, and in total, we had 2,800 students. We also ran a course in 2012 in conjunction with Bill and, Mil Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Chronicle of Higher Education and some universities. Uh, and this was Future of Higher Education course. It was a short six-week course, and we had 3,000 3, students in the course. Now, since we started developing our open online courses, let me just fix that. It bothers me when the slide's not perfect. There we go. When we started, since we started our open online courses, we've seen other organizations develop their own MOOCs. Here I'm presenting a distinction of different types of massive open online courses. I'm borrowing terminology. Well, the CMOOC and the XMOOC is my own terminology. But the, the uh, gradation or the line from networks, tasks, and contents, that is a line that was developed by Lisa Lane. And you can see the uh, link to her work there. On the CMOOC side, CMOOC stands for Connectivist MOOC, we have the courses that I just talked about, the CCK08 course, the other courses. Then in the middle, we have what might be called task-based courses. They're, they're not networks as much as our courses are, um, but they're not as content-based as the more recent MOOCs. These are courses like DS106. And if you have not investigated DS106, I certainly recommend that you take a look. It's a different interpretation of the sort of course that you can have online. And it's very much focused on the creation and the exchange of digital stories. DS in the course name stands for digital storytelling. Then on the far right of this line, we have X MOOCs. The X does not stand for anything, really. It's sort of a, a borrowing of the term that came from TEDx and came from MITx and edX, where it's maybe it's like extra or something like that. I don't know. But anyhow, the X MOOCs are the MOOCs that were created in the last year or so by generally large American universities and run through open online platforms such as Coursera, Udacity, and some of the rest. And as the listing here suggests, they're based mostly on content. The, the idea of an X MOOC is that there's a certain body of content that they want students to be able to remember, and the X MOOCs are different ways of going about facilitating that remembering. The probably the original X MOOC would be the uh, the online courses created by Salman Khan and the Khan Academy, and that's where many of the X MOOCs draw their inspiration. And these courses are essentially collections of videos, they're low production value, but they're high content and people find them really useful. And, and compared to nothing, which is the alternative, right, it's always been like con or nothing, 
Uh, they're much better than nothing, uh, and they actually work. They actually help people learn new subjects. As time has gone by, with the uh, artificial intelligence course, for example, that was offered by Norvig and Thrun, uh, the video production has improved a bit, and there have become more support materials and more resource materials. But they're still experimenting with the form, much as we have been. Just the other day, there was a course that was offered by Coursera that had to be canceled. The instructor attempted to use Google Documents in order to have people form groups, and this did not work. Basically, what happened is you had 50,000 people trying to edit the same document at the same time. And it shows, and, and this is one of the things that we learned very early on, it shows that when you have thousands of people in your course, that every aspect of the course has to be automated. You can't have some part of the course that requires human intervention in order for a person to succeed. Because even the smallest task multiplied 50,000 times becomes very major. Think about how much time a one-minute task would take for an instructor or a support technician or whomever for 50,000 people. It's not possible. And anything that is going to require an individual action is going to bog down and create a bottleneck for one of these MOOCs. So we built connectivist MOOCs, and here is a, a diagram created by a student in the uh, CCK08 course of the course, the way we set it up. Now this is what George and I set up as the course at the start of the course. And you can see some elements in this diagram that may be familiar, and you can see some elements that are new. And it, it's probably too difficult to read the small boxes, but again, you can see this diagram when you access the PowerPoint slides from my website later. I'll give you the link to that at the end of the presentation. But when we started up CCK08, we used Moodle to support the course discussion forum. We used a wiki to support administration, to create an outline, and to record where uh, links to the readings and other materials. We used Illuminate and Ustream supplemented by Twitter to facilitate live online events. We used Google Groups in order to support additional online discussion as well. We used Facebook Groups, uh, the board, the wall, and the photos, along with Facebook profiles for people who wanted to participate using Facebook. We used blog lines and Google Reader, and what we did is we asked each student in the course to create their own blog or their own website. And of the uh, 2,300 uh, participants, about 170 individuals created their own blog and or their own website. And we collected the RSS feeds for these. And we used a program that I wrote called Grasshopper, and we'll look at Grasshopper in a bit, to aggregate or to bring together the contents of those individual blogs. And we could use blog lines or Google Reader to read those RSS feeds, or alternatively, People could subscribe to a daily email newsletter in which we linked to the discussions that were being conducted by course participants. 
this daily newsletter became, I think, well, and our surveys show, the most popular aspect of the course. We also used a site called Page Flakes, which again is a type of RSS aggregator in order to create a dashboard view of the online course. We encouraged people to upload contents and then tag them using CCK08 in Flickr or in Delicious or in SlideShare or wherever they wanted. And you get the idea here, right? The idea was that there would not be one single website where we wanted all of the course activity to take place. And we would not be stepping through contents one at a time. Rather, we would have a very distributed website and we would have a set of resources basically that lived anywhere online. And then the technology that we used we use to connect the different resources together. So we did not try to present just a series of content. We tried to create and connect and make accessible a wide web of content. And it's interesting, the first complaint from people was, there's too much content. And we said, yes. We agree, there's too much content. No one person can read all of that content. In this way, it's just like the discipline you are studying. There is no way to read, to comprehend, and absorb all of the content in a given discipline. It's not possible. But what we want you as individuals to do is to look at the list of content and select the content that is most appropriate to you. Perhaps the blog articles that you find most relevant, the people to follow that you might find most interesting, or perhaps content that's in a format most suited to you. Maybe some people prefer videos, other people prefer images, other people prefer text. Each person in the course would select their own subset of content. And then in the course, we encouraged dialogue, discussion, and exchange of ideas in order to facilitate a conversation. And then in this conversation, each person is sharing their own unique perspective or their own point of view. <coughs> Excuse me. And this leads to the question of how to learn in a MOOC. This is a screenshot from a small video created by Dave Cormier and a link to an article by Tony Bates. But the concept I'm trying to express here is that in a massive open online course, unlike in a traditional course, we are not trying to learn some specific body of content. We're not trying to learn the principles of physics or the four ways to set up a course or whatever. Hang on a sec. I'm still recovering from what was a rather nasty cold and flu last week. So anyhow, Rather, the way we learn in a MOOC is that we put ourselves through a process of immersion into a knowing community. Uh, it's similar to Etienne Wenger's concept of the community of practice, except it's much less goal-driven than a community of practice. But nonetheless, the, the concept is the same idea. What we're trying to do in a MOOC is we're trying to put experts and novices and everybody else in between into the same environment. And then in this environment, 
the experts do whatever it is that the experts do. In, in, the, in the case of our MOOCs, our experts would be experts in educational technology, and they would talk about and demonstrate educational technology. Uh, in a physics MOOCs, the expert, experts would be physicists, and they would actually do and talk about doing physics. Uh, in a case about law, the experts would be lawyers and judges, and the course would involve participation in and discussion about actual court cases and actual proceedings. And the idea here is that by being immersed in this community, you can watch and follow along with the experts and participate in discussions with other students and indeed even with the experts about these topics. And by talking about these topics, by doing this kind of work, you're, putting, you're immersing yourself into this environment and learning almost as though by osmosis. Now, that does not mean you never study stuff. That does not mean that this is the only way in the world that you learn. But what we're trying to do in these CMOOCs is to create this environment that makes it possible to support this kind of learning and these other kinds of learnings. <coughs> so, how do you create a MOOC? Really, it's very simple. It's like creating a network. And the steps that you would take to create a network of connections on, say, the internet, that's the same mechanism that you would use to create a MOOC. What you're trying to do here is focus on the creation of links. You're trying to link people to resources. You're trying to link resources to each other to create perhaps concept maps or, or webs of resources. You're trying to connect people with each other. It's the creation of these links and the facilitation of conversations and interactions in these links that creates a social network. And then people use this social network. They participate in this social network in order to create their own individual knowledge. You know, a good example, and the internet is full of examples. You can find them all over the place. One example is the network of photographers uh, that I've taken part in. And I did it back a few years ago, and I've just started doing it again this year. There's a group of photographers that have, as a project, to take a picture every day and post it online. And I'm participating in that group. And the idea here is, we're doing the action, we're posting our photos, <coughs> excuse me, and we're exchanging comments about the photos. What I have found doing this is that I've become a much better photographer because I'm not just doing my own photography anymore. I'm putting it out there and hoping somebody out there on the internet responds. By participating in the community, I'm taking my photos, but I'm comparing them side by side to other people's photos. And then I'm talking with them about what I did to create my photo, what they did to create their photo. So I'm learning a skill. A skill that is inside my head, right? But I'm learning it by participating in this social network on the internet. We have in the construction of networks different principles we can apply. You know, because it's not the case that every network is the same as every other network. I have what I call 
the semantic condition for the construction of networks. And these are the conditions, in my opinion, and, and I think the opinion is well-based, but these are the conditions for a constructive dialogue. And these four conditions are autonomy, diversity, openness, and interactivity. And it's interesting when you read things like James Sirwicki, uh, The Wisdom of Crowd, or even Richard Florida on, on Knowing Societies, how these conditions come out as conditions for you know, knowledge, conditions for innovation, conditions for creativity. Autonomy means that an individual sets their own objectives, their own goals, their own priorities, and makes their own decisions about learning. It's the concept of learning, directed learning, taken seriously. Uh, it's not simply learning, directed learning, where you tell a student what you, they must learn and how they must do it, and then maybe they do a contract or something like that. It's the idea here is we present the resources for people, we create an environment, but people make their own decisions within that environment with respect to those resources. The second condition is diversity. Diversity means much more than, than racial or religious or linguistic diversity. Those are the examples that people like to use. But diversity can mean something as simple as supporting both Macintoshes and PCs and Linux and maybe BlackBerry. Diversity means <coughs> excuse me, supporting different learning styles, supporting different preferences to learning, making resources available as images or as video. Look at what I'm doing with this discussion. I'm offering an audio feed on Ed Radio and an audio video feed on uh, YouTube. This is supporting diversity. It's also recognizing the, the diversity of objectives that people have, the diversity of experiences that they have. It's employing diversity as a mechanism rather than having everybody learn the same thing, having everybody learn different things and then talking about that. The third condition is openness. And this is a condition for any successful network. Sorry, I'm really having trouble with my throat. Openness is the idea that the network is open to new members, open to new input, new ideas, and also open to people leaving. There, there's no locks on the door. People can leave the network, stop participating whenever they want. The idea is you want a fluid, dynamic, changing environment. Openness means there aren't any walls around your course. <coughs> And what that means is sometimes you don't really know whether a person is in the course or not in the course. And you have different classes or different types of membership in a course. What we found in our experience is there'll be a small core of people participating in the course. But as well, there will be people who are around the core <coughs> sorry around the core who participate less frequently or less intensively and then even people around that who sort of drop by in our case you know read the newsletter but that's about that and then even outside that a, a sphere of participation where people are what we sometimes call lurkers they're watching, not watching everything. They're not really contributing, but they're interested in the course and interested in the outcome. And then people are, are moving in and out of these spheres. Uh, 
participating more or less from week to week depending on how interested they are in the material. The final condition is interactivity or I, I sometimes say interaction, uh, engagement, cooperation is a word that I use a lot in this context. Uh, connectedness is a word I sometimes use. And the idea here is that the content of the course is created as a consequence of people interacting with each other. This is very different from the, the traditional representation of content. The traditional representation of content in a course is it's the content of a textbook or a professor's lectures or an outline or a syllabus and you take this content and you're going to transfer it to people in the course. In our version of the course, the content is created by the participants during the course as a result of them each going out and getting their own experience, their own individual perspective on the material, and then exchanging these perspectives. The knowledge is therefore not transmitted, the knowledge is emergent. It develops as a result of, or as a consequence of, these interactions, and is not the content of these interactions. <coughs> Sorry, it's such a nasty cold. I really don't recommend anybody catch it. Well, we have the antivirus here just in case. <laughs> yeah. We don't want to uh, abuse your throat. Uh, but as I said at the beginning, you were a photographer. And you had a, a great uh, repository of images um, and this idea of uh, mocks. And maybe we're running a bit uh, late. Maybe you, you if, I, don't want to, I don't know if you want to add something. If not, we can let people ask questions or start the debate with the public. Uh, we could do that. Let me just uh, give you the link to my website. So there it is. Oh, you can't see it yet. <laughs> Hang on. Uh, so there's the link to my website on the screen. Sí, sí, sí. Perfecto, sí. And uh, it's simply www.downs.ca. And uh, one more thing here. Uh, so now here's the uh, the photos that I was talking about. One photo every day. And I started in January, so there's the little house that I live in. And it's being slow. There's my cat. <coughs> there's Ganesh from India. And so on. There's a basketball game being played here in Moncton. And it's interesting because, you know, sometimes people make comments, but you can see here's our group, the One Pick a Day group. And it was formed, I think, by Grania. So here are the photographs that are contributed by all of the members. <coughs> so we, we look at them and we exchange comments on the photographs with each other, which I think is pretty cool. One thing I didn't tell at the, at the beginning, Stephen, apart from a photographer, is almost a professional player of darts. 
<laughs> and I think he really reached the goal with his uh, conference. Stephen, thank you very much. Then we will start sure. the, the debate. OK. So uh, we now open, if you agree, 10 minutes, maybe. Um, for a debate, it can be a suitable time. Yeah, any questions from the floor? Yes, please be very specific and please speak slowly so we can... <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation and for staying here with us. Um, I speak in Spanish, but <laughs> someone translate you. Um, yo quisiera preguntarle. I would like to ask you. Uh, I'm sure you know uh, this uh, criticism about all these m mocks. Um, some people say that uh, well, maybe there are problems with the massification of the students, the, the huge amount of uh, interaction, and uh, the dropouts also, um, these are issues. Mm -hmm. And um, I would like to ask, what is your uh, assessment of your proposals, uh, and if you have any survey, any analysis on that on the profile of students, or of the people that are uh, at least uh, sign in for the courses, sign up for the courses. Which is the profile of the student? Which are the features? And what are the conditions that a person needs in order to be able to access these courses and to be able to, 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 to go through it? Sure. That's a lot in one question. Uh, we did surveys of the people who took our courses, and I want to emphasize that our surveys are appropriate only for our courses, and I believe the demographics for other courses are probably very different. But the people who took our courses tended to be older, uh, they tended to be more educated. Many of them were retired. Uh, they tended to be professional. Uh, they tended to come from North America or Europe. We did have a certain representation of younger people and people from around the world, but they were a minority in our course. <coughs> like other MOOCs, we would have a significant number of people sign up at the start of the course and then disappear. So the what they call the dropout rate is substantial. And really, in a course, we would expect there to be a core of 15 to 20 percent that would, of the original number of people that signed on, that would stay on with the course through to the end. And, but, but you know, it's really hard to measure. And, and there are different measures. The 15 to 20 percent figure, I get that figure from the number of blogs that were created uh, or, or other websites that were created and that people posted to. You know, we're, we're harvesting content on a daily daily, on a, sorry, on a daily basis. So, as I said, in the uh, first course, for example, uh, we had 2,300 participants, we had 170 blogs. In the change course, we had something like 320 blogs. So, there is that number of people who participate on a regular basis, who contribute on a regular basis. On the other hand, another way of measuring participation is did they sign up for the newsletter and stay signed up? So did they keep reading the newsletter 
all the way through the course. Now, these numbers are, are very consistent. Uh, the you know we we would have well like in um, the CFHE course we had more than three thousand people sign up for the newsletter and stay signed up beginning to end. So you know people might be listening or they might be getting the newsletter and deleting it without reading it. Uh, it it's hard to tell. <coughs> But on the question of dropouts, uh, dropping out of a MOOC is not the same as dropping out of an open uh, of, of a traditional course, and that's one one of the things I tried to emphasize at the beginning of this talk. The investment to join a MOOC is you fill out a form with your name and email. Compare that to the investment to join a traditional course where you have to you know, become admitted by the university, pay a tuition fee, quit your job, go to the town, set up a new residence, attend the classes on campus. You know, if you drop out of one of those courses, it's very serious. If you drop out of a MOOC, who cares? And I think that what MOOCs are doing is eliminating the risk inherent in trying new courses or following new areas of academic interest. So in a very real sense, the dropout rate in a MOOC is a good thing. Now, it's also important that people are getting out of these courses what they want. And it doesn't mean always completing the course or memorizing a certain set of facts. Different people have different objectives. And it doesn't mean we should not be measuring for that and evaluating for that. And my observation, again, is that there is this core of participants who stick with the course to the end that find the course to have been useful and influential. One of the nice things about massive open online learning is you don't have to try to please everybody. You please who you please and you can satisfy their needs very well and the other people who you do not please go on to do something else. Finally, the, the last part of the question related to what kind of, of preparation, background, and skills, etc., you need in order to successfully participate in the MOOC. And of course, you need internet access. And the better the internet access, the easier it is to participate in the course. To me, the, the big difference in the usefulness of the internet came when I went from being connected from time to time to connected all of the time. Uh, in other words, when I, I made the transition from dial-up internet to broadband internet. Having the internet always on means that you can do things like you take these courses just as a pastime. You know, you, you have five or ten minutes free between other things that you're doing. You can pop into a course or watch a video or something like that. It's not the dedicated event that it has to be if you're only able to access the Internet at certain times. Certainly having broadband as well is important if you're going to be using multimedia like video or even audio, although these days audio can be broadcast at very low bandwidths. That's why I maintain my radio station so that people with very poor internet bandwidth can still benefit from the online presentation. Not that they take advantage of that, but it's there. Um, as well, I am told that people need to be very literate, 
very self-motivated, very interested in the subject matter. There's a whole bunch of requirements like that. I'm not completely convinced of that. I am and I'm not. Um, certainly, the participants in our MOOCs did satisfy those criteria. And I think that a person needs, in the first instance, to be motivated in order to succeed in a MOOC. Uh, the nature of MOOCs suggests that many people who do sign up for them will be motivated because people are taking these voluntarily. They're not being assigned a MOOC. If you start assigning people to MOOCs, you're going to hit this motivation problem right away. But if people are directing their own education, that addresses much of the motivation problem. As for literacies, I think one of the reasons for the popularity of video, especially in you know the X MOOCs, is that video is good for people who do not have strong reading skills. You know, one of the things about Khan Academy was that he made mathematics and physics very accessible to people without strong reading skills. And they were able, through the presentation of those videos, to develop their reading skills by participation in these classes. Now, we've experimented with that. We ran a course called Critical Literacies where we attempted to see whether people could learn the skills they need to learn in a MOOC. We still don't know the answer to that. But I think that internet technologies can, as they say, scaffold people into higher and higher levels of capacity so that people can start taking these courses at a low level and increase their capacity. Well, I think we have uh, used up all of our time. I don't know if there is more questions. If you can be very quick, and please. I'll answer it more quickly, too. One last uh, question, because we are almost out of time. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, my question is related to the implication of the community, the involvement of the community, uh, the development of the MOOCs. Uh, how do those thousands of persons that get involved in the course are making, um, are, are making that other uh, local associations, groups, get involved as well, groups concerned with the, with the community, etc. What is social dimension of your work? Not only the, the individual dimension, which makes subjects uh, join together, to come together to learn you. Sure. And that's, that's a good question. We observed, especially in the first MOOC, but in all subsequent MOOCs, that people do tend to cluster together. Uh, in CCK08, for example, we had several groups form their own Second Life community. We see people form communities around a Twitter hashtag or around a Facebook group or a Google group. These groups are largely self-organized. And the way we support them is basically we say, you know, in our newsletter and other publications, we encourage you to create groups. And if you create a group and want to share that group or get more members, tell us about it. Write a blog post or whatever or send us an email and we will advertise the existence of that group in the newsletter. And then the other thing we do is when this group begins to produce things like discussion posts or images or videos or whatever, we aggregate or harvest those new things and bring them into the newsletter. 
Now, there's no requirement that they share, and, and sometimes they don't, but the possibility that people can form their own group and still be part of the course, an official part of the course, we find is very conducive to the formation of these groups. But, you know, it's, it's you know, some people like it, some people don't. Some people join groups, other people don't. And that's the way it should be. You know, the, the idea that the Coursera course would have everybody in the course join groups, I think is ludicrous. You make it available for those who want it uh, and, and not required for those who don't. Well, we, we don't have time for more, fortunately. Uh, we could be here all the afternoon, but uh, the time is limited. I want to thank sincerely Stephen and your contribution. Um, and I want to thank the, the public here and technical team that has made this uh, so the interpreter, and uh, for us to have been able to communicate. So thank you very much to uh, all the people involved. Thank you. Thank you, and it's been a pleasure being able to speak with all of you. We're going to cut the connection now.